Hi, this is Brett Senkis with Senkis Law and Brayton Woods. Senkis Law is a business law firm focused on M&A or mergers and acquisitions. Brayton Woods is an M&A broker, two very different skill sets, legal and marketing and sales, both focused on what we call the emerging middle market, which is businesses selling between two and $20 million. If you like the video you are about to watch, subscribe, share it, ask a question, or head on over to merger-resources.com, which is a free, a collection of entirely free tools, templates, checklists, articles, videos, all sorts of stuff, all about M&A. It will supercharge your learning. And again, it's all free, merger-resources.com. Hope you enjoy the video. So today's video is about M&A litigation, specifically how to keep yourself out of litigation as a buyer or a seller when you're involved in the uh, in mergers and acquisitions. A uh, number of viewers have asked me for this uh, over the past six, nine months and uh, because it's a, it's a hot area, of course, right? No one wants to be involved in, in a lawsuit. M&A, post-closing lawsuits can be really particularly nasty. So I'm going to give you eight tips. This isn't the be-all, end-all list, but it's eight important tips to keep in mind when you're involved in M&A to keep yourself out of the courtroom. So number one. Uh, it might sound a little bit self-serving. Hey, sorry, but use uh, use professionals, use lawyers, use investment bankers or M&A brokers. Uh, you, if you're selling a business for hundred thousand dollars, you might not really be able to do that, or there might not be much budget. But if you're selling a business for uh, ten million dollars, you better darn well have some professionals involved. And so we we we. Uh, not everyone, some people view lawyers as a necessary evil, but we're here to protect our clients' backs. We're also here to make sure that deals, like what what ought to come out, comes out. A lot of times the buyers and sellers uh, are involved don't really know what to do, what to ask for, what to say. You know, we're bringing the information out so it sees the light of day, which is really important. And if there's professionals on deals where it's, you know, we've got our law firm on one side, we've got another law firm on the other, there's investment bankers, there's a lot of people around the deal. There's just a lot of activity that does run up cost a little bit, you know, but ultimately it's still sort of a drop in the bucket compared to the overall deal value. And what's important is that the information is getting out there, people are having conversations, we're asking our client, do you know about this? Are you concerned about that? That process helps work a lot of the kinks out and make sure that everyone's going in with their eyes wide open. It doesn't mean there absolutely will not be any litigation, but it's a big first step versus when buyers and sellers do things directly. Uh, I've seen a lot of times or do it through closing agents. You know, if you sell a business online, there are these brokers who just give you these forms, you just fill it in and that process just isn't very robust and a lot of times the buyers haven't done much diligence the sellers haven't disclosed much and it's just it's just a it, it's cheap and it's quick but it's kind of a recipe for problems after the fact because there's just not enough tire kicking not enough things worked out so that's number one number two and this flows from number one is have a strong purchase agreement so when we represent sellers we spend a lot of time talking them through usually the purchase agreement the first draft comes from the buyer's council we a lot of time talking them through what this means the representations and warranties that they make to the buyer those are statements of fact a representation or warranty is a statement as of today so something like i represent and warrant that there is no litigation going on i represent and warrant that all of the accounts payable on that aging report i gave you are, um, are, are that's accurate, that's complete and, and aged appropriately. It's all these statements that a buyer requires. It's even when a buyer, if a buyer's done really good due diligence, they still they still can't know everything. They don't know everything you, you would know about your business if you're selling it. So they're asking for you to make contractual, asking for the seller to make contractual statements of fact. So we walk our sellers through those. Can we make this? How would we tweak this? You know, if we say, um, it's very different if we say there are no undisclosed liabilities versus to the best of my knowledge, there are no undisclosed liabilities. So that, that is our job to get your contract um, as to get you the best deal we can when you're selling, to negotiate the best deal and still get your deal done and to help you understand what it is you're saying and what you're signing up for. Because post-closing, there is a mechanism in every private deal uh, really every private deal, although I can think of a few where there wasn't very much opportunity for the, the, the um, buyer to do anything just 
for one reason or another. In most deals, the buyer has a lot of ability to come back after the fact and say, here's what you represented, Mrs. Seller, and that's not correct. So we help our sellers understand and negotiate a good deal. There's deductibles, which basically, like if the buyer has a few nickel and dime sort of things that weren't maybe disclosed properly or weren't maybe on a, a list, if you got 100 contracts, you miss one or something, right? If they're minor damages, there's a deductible sometimes, and then there's a cap, and the cap is the ultimate out of pocket, short of things like fraud, that a seller could be post closing. So, might negotiate on a $5 million deal for a 20 or 30% cap. I mean, it's all negotiable, but that might be about right, which means total post closing representation warranty type claims could be up to a million or a million and a half dollars. That's a lot, right? And the, and the seller would have to give that back to the buyer. Our job is to help make sure that doesn't need to happen, but that's possible, but negotiating a good cap, and we've seen deals that there are no caps. So it's like you're trying to protect yourself with a really strong purchase agreement. So good advisors, great purchase agreements. Again, we're in there negotiating the best deal we can um, you know, with an eye towards not blowing the deal up and hoping to get it done if that's where our, if that's what our client wants. But getting a strong, as strong a deal on paper as you can is really important. Okay, number three run a great diligence process, a due diligence process. And this is equally important for the seller and the buyer. They have very different roles, but due diligence, and I've got all sorts of videos in this and over at merger-resources.com, there's a, there's a due diligence request list, due diligence checklist, and lots of stuff to understand this process because it's a very important process. It's the process where the buyer kicks the tires, looks under the hood, and understands what it is the buyer is about to purchase. And so that's typically done once the parties sign a, a letter of intent or a term sheet, uh, which is non-binding for most terms, but it would have exclusivity usually that says that the seller can't continue to shop the deal to other prospective buyers. And the buyer would come in and start spending real money, travel to the offices of the seller, get their accountants and lawyers to get in and dig through all the contracts and papers and just really understand the business. And that process is really important for the buyer. The seller views it usually as just a necessary evil, a, a difficult, painful process. And it can be, but for the seller, it's important too, for a few reasons. Number one is you want the buyer to know what they're buying. I mean, I understand the seller wants to get paid, I get it, but buyer's remorse is a real problem for anyone. So you wanna make sure that you've got a thorough disclosure process and, and you push liability by disclosing everything and putting it out there. The seller can be pushing liability over to the buyer. It's like, hey, you know, uh, do you want it or not? And you want a buyer to understand what it is they're buying. You really do, it's, it's super important. And you're not gonna lose many buyers by doing this, but if you, you're gonna lose the ones you should lose. But the process from the seller standpoint needs to be very well organized. There are, uh, you can organize things that used to be back in the day that we'd, you know, we'd fly all sorts of people in and we'd actually have these war rooms, we call them, where all the documents would be spread out and people would be pouring through them for, you know, 10 hours a day and making copies and things. It was all physically took place, but now it's mostly takes place online. And there's some standalone due diligence products. Intralinks is a, is a well-known one that we've used quite a bit. But Box or Dropbox or even Google Drive can do the trick. But you want a really well-organized due diligence uh, data room. You want a record of what it is you shared with the buyer. Some of these products, and you know, at the end, before you take it down, you want to freeze like all the folder structures and all the documents that were in there to know exactly what the buyer saw. You can also, with some of these products, see what the buyer spends time with, actually what they pull down or they're in for a while, which can help you understand their sensitive spots and later on show what it is that they saw. But as long as you make everything available to them, uh, whether or not they spend time with it is, is generally going to be their problem. But running a, a tight, diligent process so that you make sure as a seller you disclose everything, you do it thoroughly, you've got a good record of it, the buyer had an opportunity to view everything, the buyer then should be looking at everything and kicking the tires and asking questions. This process is really helpful to be sure that the buyer uh, kind of accepts what they're stepping into. It's a really important part of the process. And so running a tight ship and doing it very carefully will help uh, having a record of things and making sure everything is disclosed properly and, and that the buyer has the opportunity to do what they, they need to do. Okay, number four, 
don't ignore the soft issues. So deals, M&A deals tend to be uh, about the numbers. A lot of times, in particular, as you go higher up the, you know, the food chain, as the deals get larger. So we play what we call the emerging lower middle market. That's businesses selling for two to twenty million dollars. That's how we define it. Main Street is below that, and then the the lower middle market is up above it. So we're kind of in the lower lower middle. Uh, as you go up and you start to get 10, 15, 20 million dollars, those deals will be you know, well lawyered usually. You'll have big law show up on some of those deals and, and investment banks, not Goldman Sachs and the big, big, big players, but you know, decent sized banks. And um, they tend to be very numbers driven. They, strategy tends to fall into like a spreadsheet world, right? And, and they're kind of crunching numbers and figuring out what are we gonna pay and how can we get this back and throw terms around like a creative. But make sure as a buyer and as a seller that you know that there's a good cultural fit. It sounds trite, but it's so important. I forget who says culture will eat strategy for lunch. It's called culture eats strategy for lunch or something. But it's basically the idea that strategy and numbers are great, but these companies are coming together and somehow they've got to coexist. Even if one merges out of existence and one takes over, it's... They, they really, those softer issues could be real, really important to making the deal work. And so more litigation flows from deals that don't work. So if as a seller, you can help the buyer understand, is this a good fit? Particularly if as a seller, you're gonna go work for the buyer post-closing, then that's really, really important to know that you're gonna be okay working for that buyer. They might have a very different view of the world. We had a, a, a deal recently that we've had very few deals go to litigation over the years, I'd say low single digits um, or, or head towards litigation. And really, I don't know that any have ever gone into it. They've just gone into some sort of dispute process and it's a very low number. But one that we dealt with recently, the Part of the, there was a culture clash and there wasn't a lot of time spent on the soft issues and after the fact, the seller, who bear in mind has been running a company in that particular instance for you know a couple of decades, has been the, the, the head of this company, is just having difficulty being an employee. And, and, and it's hard to say you know who that is more on, but I mean, who, whose fault that is more, but some of that could be seen ahead of time. It's like there needs to be an understanding, especially if the if the seller, the selling owners are going to go work for the buyer. But even so, even even if that's not happening, that this is just going to be a good a good marriage. It's going to work out, okay. And as a selling owner, if you're going to go work and take an employment agreement, is that going to be okay? Because when the uh, buyer starts saying, "Go do it this way," "Go tell the customer that," "Tell them price it this way." I mean, it could be frustrating as a seller and there could start to be clashes and the buyer could start, and a lot of uh, litigation flows out of just, they're just, we're emotional creatures. So people get upset at each other. And some of that could be headed off if you just realize that a really important component to making an M&A deal successful is that cultural fit. Does this make sense? Do we see the world the same way? And again, it's really important if the seller, if the selling owners are, are, are gonna go work for the buyer, but it's important anyway to ensure success. So spend some time on it. So let's go into numbers five and six. And these are particular deal structures that are ripe for litigation. Number one is earnouts. So an earnout is a mechanism where the, the buyer will pay the seller more money, maybe will pay the seller more money later on, depending on the post-closing performance of the business that was sold. So it's a great, t so it's, in other words, um, if I'm buying your business and I give you a million dollars today and I say, you know, but if we do a million dollars in revenue next year, I'll give you another $200,000 or something like that. That's an earnout. It's contingent purchase price, like compensation. Earnouts are a great tool for bridging a valuation gap. Sometimes the, the seller really thinks the business is worth more and the buyer's just thinking, you know, I just, I'm not sure, I don't see it. If everything goes well, yeah, sure. So an earnout can be a good tool to kind of share risk and, and bridge a valuation gap. You always have to remember as a seller that the buyer only knows so much about your business. So by sharing their risk in the form of an, of an earnout, that can and be a way for you to get more money in the end as a seller. Sellers always want all their money at closing, but what we're suggesting with earnouts is you can get most of your money and maybe even more later. But they are tricky. So they, they, there's a lot of litigation around earnouts. So one of the reasons is earnouts that are based on profits rather than revenue are inherently problematic, especially 
if the seller isn't working for the business. So if the seller sells the business to the buyer and they're gonna get paid some multiple or some percentage of net profits in the next couple of years, they don't have visibility, they're not at the company, they're gonna start wondering what's going on. How is this business being run? If it's a big company with other departments, they might be pushing costs down. That's normal for a, a, a business to do that, to spread their um, uh, sort of corporate overhead costs across their subsidiaries, but as a seller whose earnout is based on profit, you're gonna be really kind of upset about that. Um, there's a lot of activity around this. And so we're, we're not against earnouts at all. In fact, we think they're a great tool, but we encourage our buyers and sellers to, to, to be real smart about it. Buyers, uh, of course, paying on profit versus revenue from a buyer perspective in a vacuum is a great thing. It has the problem of stirring the pot and, and sort of, it's just, uh, it's like a Petri dish for litigation. So we encourage our buyers to think long and hard about whether or not they wanna do that. Uh, it can work, especially if the seller's gonna be running a standalone, the, the, the business as a standalone division after the fact, and the parties are really clear about what overhead will be pushed into that division. But we like them based on revenue generally, even though I, I, we've, we've recommended them based on profit at, at times, they're more likely to end up in litigation. So you gotta be really careful with, with, with earnouts. Uh, second, so deal structure term is uh, working capital disputes. So in the United States, the common way to, to sell the business is what we call the closed accounts approach. What happens is the parties reach a deal, they decide on a purchase price and sign usually a letter of intent or a term sheet, and then the buyer will go off and do some due diligence. The purchase price or the headline price is based on um, the idea that the working capital at closing will be a certain amount. So working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. And a lot of businesses, it's, it's cash, it's accounts receivable, uh, inventory, minus uh, uh, accounts payable, um, deferred revenue, um, which is like revenue that's been collected and, 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 uh, but not kind of yet earned. So our prepaid revenue, and um, well, those are really those are really the big ones. They're, so so you're you're looking. You've got this measure of working capital, and it's generally the it's called the quick ratio, which is your your uh, current assets by current liabilities. Again, that's working capital, and the measure of that is it shows the company's health basically. Like you take their cash and their accounts receivable minus their accounts payable. I mean, in a lot of cases, that's all it is. If there's no inventory, if it's a service business. Somebody's got $100,000 on hand, and they've got accounts receivable, let's say $400,000, and they got accounts payable of 200, so that's 100 plus 400 is 500 of, of, of accounts, uh, current assets, minus 200 of current liabilities in the form of accounts payable. That's $300,000 net, or $300,000 of working capital. If the company's been running, <coughs> excuse me, that's the company's historically, that's what it's run at, the buyer's gonna want that amount of working capital at closing usually. They're gonna to wanna to make sure, now usually the cash comes out of the business, but not always, because the buyer wants to make sure they don't need to feed it on day one. But certainly they wanna be sure that they protect from signing a deal and saying, I'll buy your business, Mrs. Mr. or Mrs. Seller, for $5 million, <clears throat> do whatever you want, and then we close in two months. Well, it would be normal for a seller to maybe ride the trade, they call it, not pay the payables, collect out really aggressively the receivables, you know, the working capital would start going down, down, down. So consequently, in the United States, we have a working capital target number. When we get to the closing, there's usually a process of, uh, of sort of firming it up, and there's a, a balance sheet done, you know, the day before, uh, the day of closing. And then post-closing, so let's say it's $500,000 of the target working capital, um, sometimes that's being adjusted or, or, or sort of firmed up right before the closing, or there might even be a, a, a payment. We, we, the target's 500 and at closing, it looks like we're delivering the business with 600. So there might be an extra 100 paid by the seller at the closing table. But then after the closing, because uh, in a complex business, you can't know exactly what working capital is at any given moment. Things are in flux. Accounts are being paid, uh, accounts are being collected, and, and so things are, are, it's hard to know. So we've got the target number, we've got what we think it is, then post-closing, once the buyer has the business and has the keys to it, they do their own calculation of what working capital actually was on the day of closing. 
and then there's a mechanism to true it up against what the parties, you know, what, 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 they, what they believed it to be at closing. Now, the problem with this is, uh, although GAAP, General Accepted Accounting Principles, will be the standard usually that the parties use to define how the accounting is done, there's, you know, there, there are opportunities to make decisions in different ways and, you know, more art than science and things like that. So the buyer might just do the books a little bit differently or see the business differently or calculate things differently. The buyer before closing didn't know how things were done exactly. And even if you do a model uh, balance sheet and you show the seller how, uh, the seller shows the buyer how they ought to do it, there's just not an exact meeting of the minds. And then you've got the lawyers taking what the, the business deal, which is kind of complex and technical around the accounting, and putting it down on paper. There's just a lot of opportunities for things to not be quite right. It's as we say what it is, you know, it's an area of high sensitivity for us, so we're careful around it. We really educate our sellers and buyers, but you know, it's it's just it could be it could be it could be problematic. So there needs to be a lot of thought about it, a lot of working through. You want to make sure that you've got a uh, a, a clear sample balance sheet. You've got your rules of the road for how the buyer post closing is going to calculate this. You want to make sure if there is a dispute, it goes right to an independent accountant accountancy to just quickly resolve it. You want to stop it from heading into litigation. You do that in the contract. There is another tool or approach out there and it's used over in, the, the, in Europe, uh, which is called the locked box approach. And it's what I wish we used more in the United States. But what they do is they spend, instead of spending all the time in this post-closing, now the buyer's got the keys, trying to figure things out, you know, doing the, the true up. What happens is in Europe is that the parties agree to a purchase price, the same way they do in the US. But after that, uh, and, and that they, they might sign on the letter of intent or, or something as well. And between then and closing, all of the change in working capital is for the benefit or, or um, you know, is for or against, basically it's for the account of the buyer. So that things are fixed from a balance sheet perspective on the day that the parties sign, not like it is the United States where it's, it's sort of fixed at closing. They fix it well in advance. Now what this means is the buyer needs to spend a lot more time before signing that letter of intent, doing due diligence and understanding what they've got because they have to sign up for a purchase price with a certain amount of working capital. They don't know everything about the business yet and things are in flux on any given day there too. But the buyer there, by getting in and doing auditing, spending a lot more time up front, it's more costly, but it's way simpler once the parties come to an agreement. They push all the work up front and they iron it all out and get comfortable and they're done. Now there's a concept called leakage, which are like dividends and things that you can't take those out of the business between signing and closing if you're a seller and unless it's permitted leakage. So there's some definitions of it, but it's because it's supposed to be locked, hence the term locked box. And again, it's, you know, there's pros and cons to both approaches, but from a litigation standpoint, uh, particularly in a complex business, uh, it's, look, it's simpler to get all that stuff out of the way and know it's, it's, it's over and you don't have this whole true up uh, mechanism, which is really, really ripe for disputes. Okay, number seven. So far we've been talking about buyers and sellers getting involved in litigation, which is obviously the most uh, likely thing to happen if there's gonna be some post-closing litigation. A uh, buyer sues a seller, seller sues the buyer. But sellers have a, uh, sellers with a big shareholder base, or you know, really any shareholders, but the larger the base, the more likely it is that some shareholders will be unhappy and will, and will want to litigate. So shareholders don't, uh, depending on how the deal is structured, shareholders don't always have to agree for the M&A event to take place. Uh, if, it's, if it's an asset sale, substantially all the assets of the business, the board, and uh, can, can make that decision. And then the shareholders, the majority of the shareholders can make that decision under most state law. And so 51% of the shareholders could agree and 49% don't. Um, and limited partners, so there's all sorts of different versions of this depending on what type of entity it is, and the state law, the structure of the transaction. But the point is sometimes a decision is made for the whole business to be sold and some of the owners aren't happy with it. So in the more shareholders you have, the more likely that is to happen. I think something like 70% of public mergers end up in some form of so litigation in some form. It's just, 
you know, you, 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 at that point, the dollars are so big and there's so many shareholders that someone's gonna, gonna, you know, someone's gonna try and say that the deal wasn't wasn't a good deal for the shareholders. And so, how they make that is they say that the board of directors and the officers uh, breach their fiduciary duties to the shareholders. So, in corporations, the board of directors and the officers owe fiduciary duties to the corporation and its shareholders. So, they've got a, a duty of care to make decisions with all the information that they need and a duty of loyalty, you know, to exercise their duty of care properly and to do so in good faith and, you know, other things. But in this context, in the M&A context, it's to make a decision that this M&A event is in the best interest of the shareholders. And there's something under Delaware law called the Revlon duties, which are when the company's up for sale, the, the, the board has made a decision that that's what's going to happen. The, now it's just simply about maximizing dollars to the shareholders. So if a shareholder isn't happy in that process and that they can try and uh, they try and claim that it was a breach of the fiduciary duties to, to do that deal. Now the way you prevent that is to make sure that you discharge your duties when you're on the board of directors very carefully. You don't rubber stamp a deal that the CEO brings to you at the last minute. Uh, if the CEO is negotiating uh, his or her go forward employment agreement with the buyer, which happens sometimes, or acquire hires, or uh, it's a, a phrase where uh, in tech in tech world where a company is bought for basically its people. In that world, they're all, all all of the officers are negotiating their go forward employment agreements. They have an inherent conflict of interest that the board needs to recognize. And if you've got a couple hundred shareholders or anything like that, you ought to have some independent members of the board, which means board members who don't work for the company, and they have a particularly important role here. They should be meeting independently and deciding this is really is in the best interest of the shareholders. They should recognize any conflicts of interest. They may even want their own independent counsel. They want to meet often. They want to document the process. This, the amount of, uh, of meeting documentation is going to be very context specific, depending on how big the deal is, what's going on, the conflicts of interest. But you've got to take that process seriously and document it well, and that'll go a long way towards fending off possible shareholder uh, disputes. Number eight, final tip, and we're back to buyers and sellers here. Uh, include a mandatory mediation clause in your purchase agreement. So we almost always do this. There are times when our client doesn't want it, clients who really understand it for one reason or another don't want it. But generally speaking, we want this, which requires that if something goes wrong and the parties end up in a dispute post-closing, instead of immediately going to litigation or arbitration, which is going to be a long and laborious and expensive and time-consuming disruptive process, they will meet for what's usually a one-day uh, one day with a neutral third-party mediator, they'd probably pay $1,500, $2,000 each to the mediator for the day. Usually the buyer and the seller would bring their attorneys as well. So maybe it's five or $6,000 per side for travel and attorneys and mediators, something like that. Certainly not nothing. But in terms of where litigation can go and how expensive that can be, especially when the, the stakes get higher and there's just more, more complex deals, uh, this is an opportunity to try and before it all goes there to get together and, and try and figure things out. And for the buyer to say to the seller, like, let me hear it from your perspective. Let's talk this through. The mediator doesn't make a decision. The mediator's role is to just bring the parties together to amicably find a settlement. And it doesn't always work. A lot of times it doesn't work early on if the parties are, are just too sort of emotional and not ready to, to and just too upset and not ready to do a deal. But for my uh, from our standpoint, I've seen too many situations where the business people just tune out, they slam their fist on the table, they say, our lawyers will come after you, we're going to hammer you, we're going to sue you, they just talk a big game and they throw it over the lawyers and most, you know, it, it's rare a lawyer has some big sledgehammer, it goes into litigation, it's a very time consuming and difficult process, there's discovery depositions and um, it's, it's, it's just not all that much is learned along the way, a lot of money is spent and then the parties when cooler heads prevail come back and mediate in a year, year and a half, and get the deal done they should have gotten done, you know, kind of on day one. So it or should have at least taken a shot at getting done on day one. And if you mediate and it doesn't work out, you can still mediate later on, but it just, I really like to get everyone in a room and just sit there, and especially if you're someone of you who's really willing to hear the other side and understand their position. Uh, they usually have one, especially in bigger deals. Um, I mean, I, Choose my words carefully, but like 
I, I just find more sophisticated parties usually have a, a, a reasonable position. They, they, it might be wrong, right? You might win on it in court, but like taking the time to understand from their perspective where they're coming from and why they're seeing the world they are, the way they are, is, is really useful. and might have an opportunity to get a deal done and keep you out of litigation. So get something settled for a lot less money then. So consider the mandatory mediation clause. So those are eight tips. I'm sure there are others. If you've got others that I, I didn't think about, uh, drop a comment down and, and I'd love to, love to hear from you and add to the list. But those eight, if you were to follow them really religiously, the ones that apply, will go a long way towards keeping you out of hot water. There's really no reason you need to be in litigation post-closing if, if everything, I mean, it happens. It happens. I'm not going to say never again. We've got, you know, a, a few deals historically that have headed, headed that direction, but very few if everything is done um, the way it ought to be done. So hope you enjoyed that uh, video. There is um, all sorts of stuff about due diligence and these tips over at merger-resources.com. So enjoy that. And um, yeah, give me a thumbs up if you really enjoyed it and share it. I appreciate you stopping by today. Thanks.